Hello students, this video is designed to accompany chapter 6, random variables, specifically the section on binomial random variables. I'm going to be talking about how to look at a binomial random variable situation and see whether it is in fact binomial. I'm going to be talking about how to interpret the probabilities associated and then calculate some of those probabilities in question. So here we go. For the first question in this lesson, it asks, what do the following scenarios have in common? And you should have identified that all of them have similar situations, only two outcomes, heads or tails versus red, not red versus female, not female. They also have a set number of experiments. For example, this says we're going to toss the coin five times, uh, spin the roulette wheel eight times, which is a bad idea, never gamble, and then um, have a random sample of 100 babies. It's not saying, for example, I'm going to toss a coin until I get five heads. I'm not going to spin the roulette wheel until it lands on red. I say the, um, the number of outcomes before the experiment. They're randomly generated random variables. In other words, we're using a chance process like tossing a coin, uh, spinning a roulette wheel, and a random sample. The events are independent, which means the outcome of one doesn't affect the outcome of another. So if I flip the coin and get heads, it's not going to affect the next flip. If I have a baby in the sample that happens to be uh, born uh, female, it doesn't necessarily affect the next baby. This last commonality is that the probability of desired outcomes is constant. In this case, it makes sense because when you're flipping a coin, the probability of heads is 0.5. In this case, when you spin the roulette wheel, it still makes sense because, well, the ball could land on red. It's not exactly equal to 0.5, as you'll see a little bit later. Um, it is a little bit less than 0.5, but it's either going to be red or not red. Now, all of these scenarios are going to be leading us towards the idea of binomial probability. If these scenarios meet these certain criteria, um, whether they have only two outcomes, whether there's a set number of experiments, whether the events are independent, and whether the probability of the desired outcome is constant, we can refer to them as a binomial setting. Uh, um, all of those are listed here. If we count the number of successes for a binomial setting, that's called a binomial random variable, a binomial RV, as we say. And the distribution of a binomial random variable is a binomial distribution. We can use this to our advantage when we're trying to calculate the probabilities because it actually simplifies the calculation that we have to do. And you'll see that on the next page. Um, the way to remember the four qualifications for binomial settings are BINS, B-I-N-S, if you want to make up your own acronym. Well, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, in the check for understanding, it asked us to figure out whether the binomial random variables were actually binomial or not, and to explain why or why not, which means in every case, we have to take a look at each individual criterion, B, I, N, and S, and see whether it matches. In this case, it says uh, that it is a binomial random uh, variable, a binomial setting, because B, I, N, and S are all yeses. In this case, the S is no, so it doesn't count as a uh, binomial setting. It's more difficult to hit a basket from farther away, so that probability is not going to be constant. The probability is going to change. If you're standing right in front of the basket, one would hope that the probability of hitting or making the making the point, as they say, um, that's going to be easier than uh, shooting it from farther away. And then for letter C, uh, we were able to eliminate it pretty quickly by saying, well, there's more than two colors for cars. If this had said, observe the next 100 cars that go by and let C equals color and say, uh, you know, the success is if it's a red car and failure is not a red car, this would have been totally fine as a binomial setting, but it didn't, so it's not. And then here, when you're shuffling a deck of cards and drawing 10 cards without replacement, this is the big tell here, the w this without replacement tells us they're dependent events, not independent events, so that's no good. And also it tells us that the card draw changes the probability of red. If you pick out a red card, the probability of red is going to go down. If you pick out a black card, the probability of red is going to go up because there's uh, the, the number of total cards changes. On the next page, it talks about uh, rolling a six on a fair die. That's the success. And then rolling anything else is going to be a failure. So... It asks us for these probabilities, and before I go into answering these questions, I want to take a look at a tree diagram that summarizes this. This tree diagram is going to give us the sample space of all the different possible outcomes. And there were a couple of questions uh, in class about this, so I want to talk about this very briefly. Getting a 6 is a success, and getting a not 6, which is my prosaic way of saying a 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, you get a failure. So the calculation of um, the probability of failure is going to be up here. The probability of getting a success is going to be down here. And keep in mind, this is all successes and all failures. There's a whole spectrum of different uh, possibilities down here. 
and all of them have their individual probabilities. Now, this scenario does explain or does answer the first part on the page that was given, which was, what is the probability of rolling zero sixes? Well, we know for a fact that the probability of rolling zero sixes is going to be 0 0.4823 approximately, because in our, in our tree diagram here, there's only one scenario in which we fail to roll a six. So in this case, five six times five six times five six times five six is gonna give us the correct answer. However, with the probability of rolling one six is a little bit more complicated. You might think that all we have to do is multiply rolling one six probability, which is one out of six, times the probability of rolling something other than a six three times. So it looks something like this with the one sixth probability of rolling one six in the front and then the three others being the probability of not rolling one six. However, if you thought that this was the correct answer, you'd be wrong because this isn't the probability of rolling one six. It's the probability of rolling one six if the first roll is the six and the other three rolls are not sixes. To better understand what I'm talking about, let's look back at the tree diagram here. This diagram tells us that SFFF, or the probability of rolling one six as the first roll and the other three rolls are failures, this probability is the probability that we were talking about previously. However, this isn't the only outcome in which I'm getting one success, one six, because there are three more. This one up here is the probability of rolling one six, but it's the last roll. This here is the probability of rolling one six, but it's the third roll. And this down here is the probability of rolling one six, but it's the second roll. So all of these different outcomes have the same outcome, and if you want to say it like that, or all of these different outcomes have the same value of our binomial random variable. The value is equal to one. In other words, there's one successful trial and there's three failure trials, but they all have different probabilities associated with them. Or to be more specific, they all have the same probability calculated in different ways. Let me show you what I mean. Now that you see these outcomes, it's important when you're answering this question, what is the probability of rolling one six? It's not 0 0.0965 because this is only taking into account what happens if you have a success in the first spot. There are four different spots that the success can occupy. You can either roll the six on the first roll, like it says here. You could roll the six on the second roll. You can roll a six on the third roll, or you could roll a six on the fourth roll. All of these different outcomes have the same probability, but in order to represent the random variable one, in other words, one success, you need to add all of these probabilities together. So realistically, what we're doing is we're taking this 0 0.0965 and we're adding it by itself four times. Another way to do that is to multiply it by four. So I've summarized it here. It says there are four different ways to roll one six. Um, in other words, four different places where that one sixth might go. So I multiply my probability by four and I get point zero, uh, 0 0.3858. Now, when you look at the probability of rolling two sixes, I guess it's a similar problem. If you go back to the tree diagram, there are a lot of different instances in which there are two sixes. Uh, here's one and here's another and here's a third. This one is three sixes. That doesn't count. Here's a fourth. Here's a fifth. Here's a sixth. There are a lot of different ways that you can roll two sixes, two successes. So all of these different probabilities have to be added together in the same way that we added the single success probabilities together previously. So now you can see I've populated all of these probabilities. They're all 0 0.0193 rounded. So point, uh, five six times five six for two failures, one six times one six for two successes. Now they all have that in common. They all have the same two fractions being multiplied together the same number of times. Five sixths happens twice and one sixth happens twice. They're just in different orders. But as you know, the commutative property of multiplication says that it doesn't matter in what order we multiply anything by, including fractions, we're still going to get the same number. So we do this same calculation six different times. So the probability of rolling two sixes is going to be that same number, that same probability times six. So to summarize all of that, the probability of rolling two sixes is this probability six different times, or in other words, six times the probability, which is 0.1157 rounded. The probability of rolling three sixes has the same situation, but instead of doing the same thing, we're looking at the tree diagram and calculating each individual one, we're going to try to do this in a little bit smarter way. We're gonna use our probability rules for us. The probability of rolling three sixes, that means we have three successes, and we just have to figure out where those three successes could possibly go. So we're going to use something called combinations, which is something that you should remember when you learn probability. If we look back at letter A, 
hopefully this will help understand what we're talking about here. Um, we said that there's one way to roll zero sixes. If you look back at the tree diagram, uh, this is the way to roll zero sixes here. There's only one way in which you can have zero successes. So we don't have to worry about how many different ways we can order that. There's just one of them. However, there are four different ways to order one success and three failures. And there are six different ways to order two successes and two failures. So the mathematical process in order to figure this out is called a combination, and there's a formula for it, just like any other mathematical process. The concept here we're going to talk about is combinations. It's the number of ways objects can be grouped, and the combinations formula is on the calculator. Here's how you do it. I have four different possible spots, or four different possible outcomes, four different possible roles, and I wanna figure out a way to arrange zero successes. So I go, four, which is the number of different trials or experiments. And then I'm going to press math, go to probability, go to NCR, the C stands for combinations. And then, well, how many successes do I want for this first one? I want zero successes. So this tells me there's one way of arranging uh, these four different objects when there's zero successes. In this case, the probability of rolling one six, I want one success. So I'm going to do the same thing, second enter to replace everything I just typed. But now I want one success. Well, there are four different ways to do that. Instead of using the tree diagram, I was able to figure that out using combinations. 4C1 means I have four different places that these successes or failures can lie, and I want one success to be there somewhere. And there are four different ways of arranging that. If I want two sixes, we calculated that there was going to be six different ways, or rather we looked at the tree diagram. Now let's calculate it by saying, well, I want two successes in four different trials. That gives us six, lo and behold. So now instead of looking at the tree diagram to figure out this next one, what is the probability of rolling three sixes? I'm going to let my math do the work for me. I have four different spots, four different trials or experiments, and I want three successes in there somewhere, combined in there somewhere. Well, there's four different ways to do that. And we can easily verify that on the tree diagram. There are four different ways to do it. And here they are. All of these red dots indicate three different successes. And there are four of them. All right, going back here, all we have to do now is multiply the probability of three successes and one failure together, and then multiply that number by four, because there's four different ways to do it. All right, here are the probabilities, 0 0.0039 for one of these outcomes, and then 0 0.0154. Uh, incidentally, if you notice, every time I'm multiplying uh, by 4 or by 6 or whatever the case may be, the numbers get a little different. It's because I'm rounding. This squiggly equal sign means I'm rounding to four decimal places, so they're going to be a little off. All right, so what I want you to see is that there's a little pattern that's going on between all of these. Uh, we have the 5 6, which is the probability of failure, and the 1 6, which is the probability of success. This 1 6 happens the number of times of the successes, which should make sense to you. Here, there's, a, there's three 1 6 because there's three successes. Here, there's two 1 6 because there's uh, two successes. We can clean this up. We can write this as a formula just by looking at the tendencies. One success, three successes, two successes, etc. Let me show you another way that we can write this. So you can see that I've shortened it quite a bit. For example, we're multiplying the number of ways to roll this many successes times the probability of success and the number of successes is that exponent times the probability of failure and the exponent is the number of failures. Now, notice I didn't do that for this case. There are zero successes here. So what would it look like? Well, it would look something like this. I still have a probability of success here, but I put a zero there because that's the number of successes. There are zero successes and four failures. So I can do the same thing for the probability of rolling four sixes without all the other rigmarole. So you can see I tied it up all nicely in a bow. This first number is the number of ways that we can roll four sixes. The second number is the probability of success to the power of the number of successes. This is the probability of failure to the power of the number of failures. It's easy to find that probability. And the pattern that we can use to make the formula is as follows. So here we have the general formula, the number of ways we can have r successes in n experiments times the probability of success, that's p, to the power of r, the number of successes, and times the probability of failure, which is 1 minus p, to the power of n minus r, which has to be the number of failures. Try these two problems, pause the video, and see if you got them right by using this formula. All right, here's the first problem all worked out. You can see how I put it into the calculator here. And now for the second one. And here's the second example. You can see that we use the binomial probability formula three times and added them together. 
All right, this has been the video on chapter six, binomial distributions. Good luck studying.